This video is sponsored by PCBWay. Hello there and welcome back to another video. In today's video, I've got a little project that I've wanted to do for a while. Recently, I built some new LED lighting panels that I made a video on, and these panels are great. However, there is one notable issue with them. They need to be powered and dimmed with my bench power supplies, and these power supplies are not intended to be continuous duty power supplies. Because of that, plus the fact that they're linear, they get quite warm and run very, very loud while I'm recording, which is not ideal. I've been using this somewhat janky little thing to distribute power to all of my new light panels, and it's been working fine, but it's time to build something proper. So today, let's build a dedicated power supply and dimmer for these new light panels. I want to be able to dim these lights, and though that is a relatively easy thing to pull off, making sure to do it in a way that won't cause any artifacts when filming is crucial. My old lights were dimmable, and all the circuitry to dim them was in this little tiny control box, so that makes me relatively certain that they used a PWM dimming method. Now what is PWM? I hear a few of you asking, so let me go over what PWM is and how it works really quickly here. PWM stands for Pulse Width Modulation. Basically, PWM is turning something on and off so fast that we can't notice, but controlling those on and off times actually allows us to adjust the average power provided to said component. I've got a small demo set up with this LED so that you can see what I mean. We're turning on and off this LED 1000 times per second, which is too fast for the human eye to be able to perceive. There is some flickering on the camera though, and that's very important to talk about a little bit later, but firstly let's get through how PWM in of itself works. Right now, the LED LED is being given a very short pulse of voltage compared to the time where there is no voltage applied to the LED. The ratio between on and off time right now is very low, and we represent this as a percentage called a duty cycle. Right now, this is about a 20% duty cycle, which means the LED is on only 20% of the time and off for 80% of the time. As I turn up the duty cycle, so that the LED is on for about 90% of the time, watch how bright the LED gets. This is because the average power over time has increased as we're providing the LED with its power for a higher percentage of the time. This is the basis of how PWM works to control these LED lights. Seems great, right? Well, there is a problem that needs to be addressed. Flicker. Because the LED is being turned on and off repeatedly, it can have some interference with cameras and shutter speeds which will cause the lighting in a video to flicker, which is a very very distracting artifact. As I've mentioned, my old LED lights used a PWM dimming method, but I never ran into any flickering issues with them, so they clearly use a PWM carrier frequency that works well with all the filming configurations that I've used them for. I always film my videos at 30 frames per second with a 1 60th second shutter speed, but I have used other frame rates and exposure settings in other situations with those same old LED lights, so I'm pretty confident that their frequency is issue free. Now let's find out what that frequency is so that I can use it in my project and not reinvent the wheel. To do this, I'm going to take apart one of my old lights and plug it into a battery bank while I've got my oscilloscope set up so I can watch what frequency it uses. I had to use a battery pack to power the light while using the scope because otherwise there were some grounding issues when connecting the light to a computer that was plugged into the same power strip as my scope was. I turned on the light at half brightness and set the trigger on the scope so that I could get an accurate frequency reading. Once I'd done this, I got the frequency reading and it was 19.85 kilohertz. All right, now that I know the frequency that I'm going to use for my own light dimmer, it's time to figure out some basic project requirements. I want this controller to have three light outputs for the three light panels that I use, and I also want it to be able to control each channel individually. In addition to that, I do want there to be a switch that will allow me to switch between individual channel controls and one control for all three channels so that all the lights are linked up. After a while spent in Fusion, I had a prototype of a design to give some tests to. There was a lot of troubleshooting to get this circuit fine-tuned enough for the final product, which I'm going to go into in a bit of detail here. The entire circuit is based around the Raspberry Pi Pico, which I chose because it's incredibly easy to get the right PWM frequency out of this board. It's so simple, it's just a singular line. An Arduino Nano's default PWM frequency is 490Hz, and though you can change it with the timer controls on the Arduino Nano, it's far more complicated and honestly honestly something that I just don't understand how to do properly. Hence, I chose to use the Pi Pico, which is thankfully about the same price as a knockoff Arduino Nano. With the first prototype circuit built up, I got to testing. After several small tweaks regarding a soft startup circuit that I had implemented originally, which ended in that circuit being removed, I was ready to test the actual PWM dimming functionality. I built the circuit to run off of a 24 volt power supply, as 24 volt 5 amp adapters are very affordable online. 
The original plan was to take the 24 volts and feed it straight into the light panel PWM circuit, as these panels aren't designed to run on 24 volts, but I plan to just limit the duty cycle so that the maximum average voltage the LEDs could get would be 15 volts, which is what they're designed to run at. However, there was a serious flaw in this design. It was very inefficient and the MOSFET switch that did all the switching for the light power got exceptionally hot. Far hotter than it ever should have been getting and it was a completely unacceptable performance. All right, I'm gonna quickly apologize for how about every production aspect of this shot is horrible, but I just wanna update on this. And I'm driving the switching stage with my function generator and I'm supplying it with 15 volts, which is what these lights, kind of their maximum power is supposed to be. So it's supposed to be about 15 volts. And I was doing 24 before because I was thinking, no, you just don't use 100% of the duty cycle on the PWM wave, right? And you can use 24 just fine because the average will max out at 15 if you use, I think it was about 60% duty cycle max. You know, the MOSFET was getting really, really hot. And now at 15 volts, it doesn't get really hot. I'm not sure why, but all I know is that we can't do 24. We have to do 15. It took me a while to deduce that this was the problem, but I ended up figuring it out in the end, and now the circuit is designed to run on a 15 volt, 6 amp adapter with a nicely refined and efficient dimmer circuit. So, with my circuit designed, it was time to send these files off to the sponsor of today's video, PCBWay. PCBWay offers many manufacturing services, such as 3D printing, CNC machining, and, of course, PCB manufacturing. I ordered the PCBs for this lighting controller, and the lights that it controls, from PCBWay, and the quality as well as the prices have both been stellar. I'm providing the files and designs for the light panels and this control box at a couple links in the description. So if you're thinking of building this project for yourself, check out PCBWay when you want to order your your PCBs and 3D prints for this project. Anyway, while I was writing for the boards to arrive, I went ahead and designed an enclosure for the project so that I could 3D print this on my 3D printer. I made it so that it has all three control potentiometers on the top, alongside the switch that switches the control scheme between individual channels and a single unified control. It's also got holes for the sockets that the lights will plug into, and of course a power jack and power switch. Once the enclosure was printed out, it was time to get to work on assembling the controller. This project isn't too heavy on components, especially if you have some relatively basic ones on hand, but it's certainly not the lightest thing to make either. Aside from the board components, you'll need three potentiometers, and the resistance of those potentiometers doesn't really matter much at all, although I wouldn't go below one kilo ohm. You'll also need some smaller, less detailed components like the barrel jack, an on-off switch, a slide switch, some knobs, and a 5 amp fuse which isn't technically necessary, but I chose to include that for the sake of being safe and thorough. The last parts you'll need, and I do want to address these in a bit of detail, are the connectors for the lights. I chose some connectors that are probably not the most economical choice, but I really like the way that they work in this case, so I decided to use them. These are TS connectors, and several of you are probably familiar with these if you play an electric guitar or bass. TS connectors are commonly used in audio applications and usually only transmit instrument level or line level signals, which compared to the 15 volts that these lighting panels use are far weaker signals. Now, the thing with these connectors is that even though they aren't always seen used in higher power applications, they are more than capable of driving a bunch of power and are used to transmit large amounts of power in a lot of commercial applications and products. Take, for example, this bass cab. This is just a speaker that gets plugged into an amplifier for playing the bass guitar. This is a 200 watt cabinet, and all 200 watts of that power is put into the cabinet through, you guessed it, a single quarter inch TS connector. So, though it might seem unconventional, and really it kind of is, using TS connectors for my lights is not a crazy thing to do. Though, just be careful not to plug your guitar or audio interface into this box, as it might damage them. Another word of caution when building this thing, make sure that you don't have headers on your Pi Pico. The only package that I could easily find for the Pi Pico was an SMD one, which allows you to use the pads on the Pico to embed it directly onto the board. All of my Picos had headers soldered onto them, and so I went ahead and desoldered the headers from one of them, which was a far less painful job than I originally thought it would be. And while on the topic of the Pi Pico in this project, if you're following along at home, you need to make sure that you program the Pi before you solder it to the board. There is not enough clearance to connect most standard micro USB cables to the Pico while it is soldered to the board, so it'll be a real nightmare if you don't program it before you solder it down. 
Once my board was all soldered up, it was time to mount it into the enclosure. Then, I slotted in the on-off switch and screwed in the DC jack. After that, I connected my 5 amp fuse between the positive of the DC jack and one of the poles of the switch. You can use a regular piece of wire if you aren't choosing to use a fuse, but the one thing that you need to make sure you do when wiring up this switch, and this goes for a lot of power switches, is that you need to make sure that you set the switch up in a way that it severs the connection in the live wire when you turn it off. When you do that, the entire circuit is left connected connected to ground when you turn off the circuit instead of being pulled up to live through the uninterrupted live connection if you were to sever the ground wire. Lastly, I finalized the power connections by connecting the negative terminal of the barrel jack to the negative power input terminal on the PCB, and then I connected the unused terminal on the switch to the positive terminal on the PCB. Next, the TS socket connections need to be made. I should mention, I'm using 18 AWG solid core copper wire for all of these power handling connections because this wire is more than capable of carrying the currents that these connections will see, and its stiffness is somewhat useful for making rigid cable routes. Though, any wire that is 18 gauge or bigger should be fine. With the TS connections all made and nicely isolated with some heat shrink, I had a pretty perfectly set up box that I was ready to finalize with the lid and potentiometers. I connected some small 22 AWG stranded wires to the pins of the three potentiometers and then I connected some female 2.54 millimeter headers onto the other end of the wires. I did the same thing with the switch, though the wire that I used here was a little too short and I had to elongate it with some male to female DuPont jumper wires. Make sure to heat shrink this stuff too because you don't want any shorts to happen. And now it's the final stretch. The last major part of this project is connecting the potentiometers and the switch to the top cover so that we can plug them in and screw the lid down. Because these potentiometers have a little nub on them that is intended to be used to stop their body from rotating, and I didn't want to file this off when I was mounting the potentiometers, I used a little bit of glue to make sure that the body of the potentiometer couldn't go anywhere when I can't tighten the retaining nut as much as I might like to due to that little nub. The switch in this design is intended to be mounted entirely using glue, so position the switch and then glue it into place. The dimensions of my switch holder were a little off on the lid that I printed out, but I went ahead and fixed the dimensions in the model that I provide in the description. And finally, it's just a matter of connecting all the wires to the board, making sure that with the three legs of the potentiometer facing you, the leftmost leg of each potentiometer is connected to the leftmost pin of the plugs on the board. This will ensure that the potentiometers control the intensity of the lights in the correct way. Otherwise, when turned left, the lights will get brighter, and when turned right, they'll get darker. On a similar note, make sure that when the switch is in the position where it connects the two contacts that we soldered wires to, it's on the right side of the lid to be in the linked section. Otherwise, when you move the switch to the individual setting, the controller will actually work in linked mode and vice versa. And with that, the box is done. Here you can see what this little box does for the lights. It takes a supply voltage from an external power brick, which frees up my bench power supplies, and allows me to control my three light panels with it. Here I have one light plugged into channel one of the controller and it's set to individual mode. It controls the light beautifully and so do the other two channels in individual mode as well. Then, when switching it over to linked mode, the one bottom knob that usually corresponds to channel one controls all three outputs with the same signal. I had only been testing with one of my three light panels up until this point because I needed to be able to film my testing with the light from the other two but I now went ahead and terminated the other two lights with the correct TS connectors and plugged all of them into the lighting controller to give it one final test. In linked mode, it controlled all three of my light panels perfectly based on the signal that was created with potentiometer one. Then, in individual mode, I was able to control all three of the light panels entirely independently from one another, which is exactly what I wanted. This project was a resounding success, and I'm really happy with how it turned out. Remember that all of the files and instructions for this project are located in the video description, so if you want to build something like this, you absolutely can. I'd also like to thank PCBWay one more time for providing their high-quality PCB manufacturing service for this project, as it wouldn't have been possible without them. That's all I have for you in this video. I hope to see you next time. Goodbye.